this time I am having great 11th English chapter number 8 Silk Road for your revision. This chapter has been taught uh, to you earlier and we are going to revise it and we are going to reflect back and we are going to see that uh, how the story was, how the chapter was. It is not a story but a uh, kind of a journal of the author whose name is Nick Middleton. Okay, Nick Middleton. So the author writes about his uh, experience that he had when he was heading to the journey of Mount Kailash. Okay, Kailash Mount. Uh, sorry, Kailash Mansarovar Yatra is very popular, and every year. The pilgrims, the pilgrims, the shraddhalus, they go there and they head towards Mount Kailash and they go there and one more reason for going to Mount Kailash is to do Kora. Okay, Kora, the people go there, it is in the Buddhist philosophy to uh, go and do a Kora. Kora is uh, going in round circles and uh, praying to the Lord for uh, his blessings. So this is what uh, the narrator Nick Middleton is also heading to Mount Kailash for. And in his way he got uh, to several points where it was very interesting. He uh, met with many people of Tibet and he got presents also. He waited in Darjeet one place. There he found a very difficult, he found himself in a very difficult situation and through all this he came out and successfully conducted the Kora but in this story you will not uh, see how he will do the Kora and Mount Kailash but it is a small uh, account of the big journey that the narrator goes through he has just uh, told us about how he approaches for the journey and how he uh, comes out of different situations even before starting the trek for Mount Kailash. So this is a very interesting story. I hope you have read it before. Your uh, sir has already explained everything. Now we are going to explain, we are going to revise it with me and you will see that what are the key uh, points of the chapter, how the uh, narrator goes through the journey and everything we will revise in this lecture. So stay connected, stay till last and uh, I'm Aman from Arden Progressive School. You're watching video classes. Let's read again the story Silk Road. Okay, let us read the chapter Silk Road and once more we will go through the chapter. We have already read it before and you already know what is there in the chapter but this will be just a revision lecture and we will again see that what were the key points of the story of the chapter and we will reflect back all the things that were important for us to understand. So without wasting much time let's start reading of the chapter Silk Road. It is as you can see from the uh, front page from the first page the title it is written by Nick Middleton. Okay so Silk Road is written by Nick Middleton as I've, uh, as we have read it earlier also and you have been told that this story is about a journey the author goes through the Rabu hills to Mount Kailash okay so let's begin a flaw less half moon floated in a perfect blue sky on the morning we said our goodbyes extended banks of cloud like long french loaves glowed pink as the sun emerged to splash the distant mountain tops with a rose tinted blush now that we were leaving ravu lamo said she wanted to give me a farewell present so in the first paragraph we see that the narrator is saying that we are bidding goodbye. They are heading towards 
their main destiny and they are leaving Rahu. Okay, so they are heading to the Mount Kailash and they are leaving Rahu. And there one girl is there whose name is Lamo. She is going to give the author, the narrator, a present for good memory. One evening I I told her through Daniel that I was heading towards Mount Kailash to complete the Kora and she had said that I ought to get some warmer clothes after ducking back into her tent. Okay, so one evening through one person Daniel, the author has told her that he will be going to Mount Kailash. So she was concerned about him that he will feel cold there and for that he needs to have some warmer clothes. After ducking back into a tent, she emerged carrying one of the long sleeved ship skin coats. Okay, so after uh, this, after she uh, told her that she will be giving him a present or something, so she ducked back, she went back to the tent and she brought back one long sleeved ship skin coat. Okay, for the narrator, the, all all of the men used to wear this in the region when the weather was cold. Satan sized me up as we clambered into his car. Ah, uh, yes, he declared, "Drug bus, sir." So Satan, who was the driver, he sized me up means he looked the narrator. He check that how the cloth was how the coat was fitting we took a shortcut to get off for the chang tang Setan knew a route that would take us southwest okay so they then drove off from Ravu and they uh, took a shortcut to chang tang and Setan the driver was knowing a way to get directly towards Mount Kailash. It involved crossing several fairly high mountain passes, he said. But no problem, sir, he assured us. If there is no snow, what was the likelihood of that, I asked. Not knowing, sir, until we get there. So, he was telling them that it will be difficult if the snow would be there. And the narrator asked him that what are the chances that the snow would be there? Then uh, the driver replied, I don't really know that how much snow and whether it would be there or not. From the gently rolling hills of Ravu, the shortcut took us vast open plains with nothing to them except a few gazelles that would look from look up from nibbling the arid pastures and frown before bounding away into the void so from the hills it was only the vacant land that was all around further on where the plains became more snow stony than grassy a great herd of wild ass came into view okay now the grass was um, absent and more stones were there the path were was stony. Setan told us we were approaching them long before they appeared. Kyang, he said, pointing towards a far off pail of dust. When we drew near, I could see the herd galloping and mass. Okay, when they drew near the flock of uh, wild ass, the herd, sorry, the herd of wild ass, what happened? They, uh, the narrator could see that how many of them were there and they were uh, searching for food, searching for grass, wheeling and turning in right in tight formation as if they were practicing maneuvers. Maneuvers means uh, the moves you practice before any war, the strategy, the strategical moves, the war uh, practice you do, okay, on some predetermined course. They were looking like they were having some war strategy war formation they were doing plumes of dust billowed into the crisp clean air okay what happened the dust was flowing everywhere the wild ass they were running they were 
coming forward so dust was all around as hills started to push up once more from the rocky wilderness we passed solitary drogbas tending their flocks drogbas are the people common people and uh, they passed them sometimes men sometimes women these well wrapped figures would pause and stare at our car occasionally waving as our as we passed when the track took us close to the animals the sheep would take evasive action veering away from the speeding vehicle so everyone was looking over the group of people moving in a car the local people were looking at them when the car would be near the animals they would be afraid and they would run here and there this was happening we passed nomads nomads what are nomads uh, the people who don't have any particular place to reside they keep on moving from here to there dark tents pitched in splendid isolation usually with a huge black dog a tibetan mastiff okay so the nomads the tent was there and uh, there or in all the tents there was a black dog a tibetan mastiff standing guard these beasts would cock their great big heads when they become aware of our approach and fix us in their sights so what were, were the reaction what was the reaction of the big dogs they used to shake their heads when they see them see the narrator so they used to cock their head they used to uh, swirl their head in a very rapid movement as we continued to draw closer they would explode into action speeding directly towards us like a bullet from a gun and nearly as fast so when uh, the narrator and his uh, crew would be close to the mastiffs the tibetan mastiffs they would speedily come uh, forward and like a gun they like a bullet from a gun they used to rush towards them and earlier they were just cocking their head These shaggy monsters blacker than the darkest night usually wore bright bright colors and barked furiously with massive jaws they had massive jaws they were all black and they used to bark very furiously they were completely fearless of our vehicle they were not afraid of the vehicle like earlier the sheep were there right the sheep were uh, whenever they saw the vehicle they used to run away but the black dog the tibetan mastiffs they were not at all afraid of the vehicle they were adamant they were stern with their approach they were completely fearless so shooting straight into their path causing shaitan to break and swear so shaitan had to break put brakes because the dogs were directly coming to the vehicle the dog would make chase for 100 meters or so before easing off the dog would run after them for 100 meter then it used to break off having seen all of the property it wasn't difficult to understand why ferocious tibetan mastiffs became popular in china's imperial courts as hunting dogs okay brought along the silk road in ancient times as tribute from tibet okay so here the title silk road is also coming to play when chinese used to come from the silk road they used to bring the tibetan mastiffs uh, with them to protect them by now we could see snow capped mountains gathering on the horizon we entered a valley the river where the river was wide and mostly clogged with ice okay they entered a valley where there was a river and it was freezed and it was full with ice brilliant white and glinting in the sunshine the trail hugged its back twisting with the meanders as we gradually gained height and the valley sides closed in the turns became sharper and the right bumpier shaitan now in the third gear as we continued to climb shaitan now put the third gear as they were heading towards the destiny the track moved away from the icy river laboring through steeper slopes that sported big rocks daubed with patches of bright orange lichen beneath the rocks hunks of snow clung on in the near permanent shade 
I felt the pressure building up in my ears. Okay, so what was happening? Satan was now um, putting the third gear and was very rapid, was eager to go fast, and the slope the slopes were steeper now. The mountains were steeper. The big rocks were there in the path beneath the rocks. Hunks of snow was there, and the narrator was feeling pressure in his ears. and he held his nose knotted and cleared them because of the high altitude it was happening with him we struggled round another tight bend and sitan stopped he had opened his door and jumped out of his seat before i realized what was going on snow said daniel as he too exited the vehicle letting in a breath of cold sorry breath of cold air as he did so so Satan jumped away from the vehicle. So did the the boy uh, Daniel. And now, a swath of white stuff lay across the track in front of us, stretching for maybe fifteen meters before it peered out. The snow continued on either side of us, smoothing the abrupt bank. The bank was too steep for a vehicle to scale, so there was no way round the snow patch. I joined Daniel as Satan stepped onto the anchor's snow. and began to slither and slide forward stamping his foot his foot from time to time to ascertain how sturdy it was i looked at my wrist watch we were 5210 meters above sea level okay so they started putting the snow away and they were 5210 meters above sea level that was the height they were at and they were uh, trying to remove the snow from the path the snow didn't look too deep to me but the danger was in the depth daniel said so much as its icy top layer if we slip off the car foot turn over okay he suggested as we saw sitan grab handfuls of dirt and flinch them across the frozen surface so what was the concern that the snow will break if they will put their vehicle over it and uh, so satan was putting dust over the snow so that uh, the path could be a little rough and their vehicle could move we both pitched it in pitched in and when the snow was spread with soil daniel and i stayed out of the vehicle to lighten satan's load he backed up and drove towards the dirty snow eased the car onto its icy surface and slowly drove its length without apparent difficulty 10 minutes later we stopped at another blockage not good sir sitan announced as he jumped out again to survey the scene okay so uh, narrator and daniel both were out of the car so that sitan could drop very easily but again 10 minutes later sitan uh, came out of his vehicle to check and he was saying not good the slope was steep and studded with major rocks but somehow satan negotiated them his four wheel drive vehicle lurching from one obstacle to the next in so doing he cut off one of the harpin bands regaining the trail further up where the snow had not drifted okay so now there was uh, the slope was very steep and it had rocks but somehow satan negotiated through them all and in doing so so in doing so he cut off one of the harpin bands okay what is uh, what does it means when he was trying to cut uh, through the way he cut off one of the bands regaining the trail further up where the snow had not drifted i checked my watch again as we continued to climb in the bright sunshine we crept past 5400 meters and my head began to throb horribly so narrator was having dizziness because of the height i took girls from my water bottle which is supposed to help her rapid ascent we finally reached the top at 5515 meters it was marked by a large cairn on of rocks okay with white silk calves and dragged prayer flags okay when you reach the top of the mountain this is there um, in those region there are lot of flags been put by the uh, people who have climbed through that 
who have reached the top they have put their flags so they were seeing all around that red player sorry prayer flags were all around we all took a turn round the cairn uh, sorry the cairn in a clockwise direction as in the tradition and shaitan checked the tires of his vehicle so they were doing the kora a small kora they were doing there not the big one the kora is the uh, is that um, the people go in round for uh, praying they took uh, the uh, what what do we say they took a march around in circle so that uh, their uh, their religious thing gets done with okay the lower atmospheric pressure was allowing the flu fuel to expand it sounded dangerous to me maybe sir shaitan laughed but no smoking my headache soon cleared as we carried down carried down the other side of the path it was 2 o'clock by the time we stopped for lunch we had hot noodles uh, inside the tent and the plateau is pockmarked with salt flats and brackish lakes vestiges of the teeth oceans which border tibet before the great continental okay so now they had a little food they had the hot noodles inside the uh, tent and they were uh, a site the dark sorry the dry salt lake the plateau is pockmarked with uh, salt pl- flats and brackish lakes vestiges of the uh, tethys ocean which border tibet before the great continental so everywhere around small uh, brackish lakes were there and salt flats were there this one was a heavy activity men with pick axe and shovel strutting back and forth in their long sheep skin coats and salt encrusted boots all wore sunglasses against the glare as a steady stream of blue trucks emerged from the blindly blindingly white lake laden with piles of salt so from there salt was taken out and this was a very hectic activity by late afternoon we reached the small town of hor and uh, back on the main east west highway old trade route from lhasa to kashmir daniel who was returning to lhasa found a ride in a truck so shaitan and i bade him farewell so from here daniel bid farewell to both of them he was heading towards lhasa uh, to kashmir and uh, the people were going to kashmir from lhasa and now they were returning back so daniel wanted to go to lhasa his destiny was lhasa so he joined the people who were going in a truck and the narrator and his uh, driver bit daniel goodbye they were outside a tire repair shop their two tires were punctured and uh, besides the second tire that he had changed had been replaced by the one that was smooth as my bald head so now we come to know about the um, about the appearance of the writer also that he was bald Hor was a grim miserable place there was no vegetation whatsoever just dirts and rocks liberally scattered with ears of acclimated refuse which was unfortunate given that the town sat on the shore of lake ponsarovar okay there was no vegetation no greenery around no flocks around no animals around just rocks and dust liberally scattered with ears of accumulated refuse okay waste was there which was a very bad thing see mansarovar lake is there kalash mountain is there such a lovely site is there but still people do littering all around and this is about india that is a very bad thing when we see when we are around some place we do this only okay ancient hindu and buddhist cosmology pinpoints mansarovar as the source of our four great indian rivers indus ganges satluj and brahmaputra actually one only the satluj flows from the lake but the headwaters of the others all rise nearby on the flanks of mount kailash so four of the rivers were there but uh, only satluj 
flows from the lake but others had their a little wet portion of the the river in that part also but i had to wait we were we were uh, within the distance of the great mountain but they had to wait Setan told me to go and drink some tea in horse only cafe which like the other buildings in town was constructed from badly painted concrete and had three broken windows okay so there was a tea shop which had broken windows and was badly constructed so Setan uh, advised him to go for a tea the good view of the lake through one of them helped to compensate for the trot so one from one of the broken window the narrator was looking out and watching the sight of the great huge mountain i was served by a chinese youth in military uniform who spread the grease around my table with a filthy rag before bringing me a glass and thermos of tea so a uh, chinese youth in military uniform he was the worker he was the uh, worker in the tea shop he cleaned up the table and brought the tea and thermos my experience in hor came as a stark contrast to accounts i had read of earlier travelers first encounters with the lake with lake man sarova a kal kawaguchi a japanese monk who had arrived there in 1900 was so moved by the sanctity of the lake uh, sanctity of the lake that he burst into tears a couple of years later that hollowed waters had a similar effect on seven Swen Hedin. Okay, so now the narrator is mentioning the name of all those who had come before, and who had come in the beginning, and uh, they were all very sentimental, emotional of the sight of the great mount, uh, mountain, Mount Kailash. It was dark by the time we finally left again, and after ten thirty p.m., we drew up outside a guest house in Darchin for what turned out to be another troubled night. Kicking around in the open air rubbish dump that passed for the town of Hor had set off my cold once more. Though, if truth be told, it had never quite disappeared with my herbal tea. One of my nostrils was blocked again, so again cold was there. Damp cold was there in Darchin, and narrator was again feeling it. I wasn't convinced that the other would provide me with sufficient oxygen. My watch told me I was four thousand seven hundred sixty meters. It wasn't much higher than Ravu. and there i had been gasping for oxygen several times every night i had grown accustomed to these nocturnal disturbances nocturnal from the nose he was having difficulty that are called nocturnal disturbances but this still scared him tired and hungry i started breathing through my mouth after a while i switched to single nostril power which seemed to be admitting enough oxygen but just as i was drifting off i woke up abruptly something was wrong so here in darchin he was feeling cold his nostril was blocked and now he was again feeling that some bad thing is happening my chest felt my chest felt strangely heavy and i set up a movement that cleared my nasal passage almost instantly and relieved the feeling in my chest curious i thought okay so he was having uh, he was having a heaviness in his chest i lay back down and tried again same result i was on the point of disappearing into the land of nod when something told me not to he was feeling like he is going to die it must have been those emergency electrical impulses but this was not the same as on previous occasions this time i was not gasping for breath i was simply not allowed to go to sleep sitting up once more immediately made me feel better i could breathe freely and my chest felt fine but as soon as i lay down my sinuses filled and my chest was hot i tried propping myself upright against the wall but now i couldn't manage to relax enough to drop off i couldn't put my finger on the reason but i was afraid to go to sleep so narrator was feeling that if he will sleep he will not wake up any more a little voice inside me was saying that if i did i might never wake up okay setan took me to the darchin medical college the following morning the medical college at darchin was new and looked like a monastery from the outside with a very solid door okay 
We found consulting room which was dark and cold where a Tibetan doctor who wore none of the pari paraphernalia that I had been expecting. Paraphernalia means uh, the coat that the doctors wear. No white coat. He looked like any other Tibetan with a thick, with a thick pullover and a woolly hat. When I explained my sleepness, uh, sleepless symptoms and my sudden aversion to lying down, he shot me a few questions while feeling the veins in my wrist. It is a cold, he said finally through Satan. A cold and the effects of altitude. I'll give you something for it. I asked him if he thought I would recover enough to be able to do the Kora. Oh yes, he said, you will be fine. I walked out of the medical college clutching a brown envelope stuffed with 15 screws of paper. I had a 5 day course of Tibetan medicine which I started right away. I opened an after breakfast package and found it contained a brown powder that had to be taken with hot water. It, it tasted like cinnamon. The contents of the lunchtime and bedtime packages were less obviously identifiable. Both contained small spherical brown pellets small tablets they look suspiciously like sheep dung okay they were looking like sheep dung but of course i took them the night after my first full day's course i slept very sound like a log not a dead man okay so the medicine was very nice once she saw that i was going to live Satan left me to return to Lhasa as a Buddhist, he told me he knew that it didn't really matter if I passed away, but he thought it would be bad for business. Okay, so when Satan saw that he is fine now, he left him. Darchan didn't look so horrible after a good night's sleep. It was still dusty, partially derelict, and punctuated by heaps of rubble. Okay, so uh, he spent the night there and he washed around he had the vision of himalayas and uh, gurla mandata with just a wisp of cloud suspended over its summit summit the peak point of the mountain the town had a couple of rudimentary general stores selling chinese cigarettes soap and other basic provisions okay so there were small shops around darchan felt relaxed and unhurried but for me it came with a significant drawback there were no pilgrims there were no pilgrims. Koi bhi vaha. The uh, Shraddhalus were not there. I had been told that at the height of the pilgrimage season, the town was bustling with visitors. Many brought their own accommodation, enlarging the settlement round its edges as they set up tents. One afternoon, I sat pondering my options over a glass of tea in Darjan's only cafe. After a little consideration, I concluded they were severely limited. Clearly, I didn't make much progress with my self-help program on positive thinking okay so now narrator was thinking that i am in darchan i have to climb the mount kailas i have to do the kora i have to do uh, this uh, to do the rituals and now he was thinking alone how i will go to mount mountain this was until i met norbu the cafe was small dark and cavernous with a long metal stove that ran down the middle the walls of ceiling uh, uh, the walls and ceilings were wrapped in sheets of multicolored pla plastic okay and he met one man there whose name was Norbu and it was uh, the cafe was looking like it is in china the cafe had a single window beside which I had taken up position so that I could see the pages of my notebook. I had also brought a novel with me to help the pass, to help pass the time. Norbu saw my book when he came in and asked with a gesture if he could sit opposite me at a rickety table. You English? He inquired after he had ordered tea. I told him I was and we struck up a conversation. I didn't think he was from those parts because he was wearing a wind heater and metal rimmed spectacles of a western style he was a tibetan he told me but worked in beijing at the chinese academy of social sciences in the institute of ethnic literature i assumed he was some sort of field work yes and no he said i have come to do the kora my heart jumped 
Norbu had been writing academic papers about the Kailasa, Kailas Kora, its importance and uh, in various works of Buddhist literature for many years, he told me, but he had never actually done it himself. When the time came for me to tell him what brought me to Darchan, his eyes lit up. We could be a team, he said excitedly. Two academics who have escaped from the library. Perhaps my positive thinking strategy was working after all. My initial relief of meeting Norbu, who was also staying in the guest house, was tempered by the realization that he was almost as illiquid as I was for the pilgrimage. He kept telling me how fat he was and how hard it was going to be. Very high up, he kept reminding me, so tiresome to walk, he wasn't really a practicing Buddhist. Okay, so he was not very positive of going up. He was just looking for a company and the narrator wanted some help, but he was getting someone whom he will have to help more. He wasn't really a practicing Buddhist, but he had enthusiasm and he was, of course, Tibetan. But even though he was not very confident, but he was a Tibetan and they were used to of all the mountains and stuff. Although I had originally envisaged making the trek in the company of devout believers on reflection, I decided that perhaps Norbu would turn out to be the ideal companion. He suggested we hire some yaks to carry our luggage, which I interpreted as a good sign, interpreted uh, as a good sign, and he had no intention of prostrating himself all round the mountain. Not possible, he cried, collapsing across the table in hysterical laughter. It wasn't his style, and anyway, his tummy was too big. Okay, so here the story, the chapter concludes. Uh, the narrator started off his journey from Ravu. He bid goodbye to Lamo, Daniel, and his driver Setan. Then he reached Darchin. Darchin in Darchin, he uh, was feeling low because he had no company to go to the Mount Kalas for his Kora. There he met with one more uh, person who had come to Kora and to do Kora, whose name was Norbu. Then narrator finally decided to go for his track. So I hope that it had been a good uh, time for you. You have understood the lecture. You have gone through the chapter before also. But if any doubts are there, feel free to ask and we will meet again soon with some more revision stuff. So I am Aman from Arden Progressive School. You were watching video classes. Thank you so much for watching the lecture.